think that it's really important, if I can put, turn it around, that the SDGs uh, be seen through the prism of landscapes, which means that we don't just look at the targets, the obvious targets that focus on terrestrial ecosystems or forests or water or even oceans, but that we take those targets that might not be so obvious and put a landscape lens on them. So when we talk about pro uh, PPP, pr private-public partnerships, we really understand and unpack what that means at the landscape level, what that means in terms of smallholders. Because in essence, when you look at natural resource management, forests, fisheries, it is essentially about a public-private partnership. When you look at issues related to women's participation, women are very important stakeholders in forest management and natural resources management. So rather than just looking at a target on women's participation in a sort of generic way, that we actually look at it through the lens of the landscapes and what landscape management means for women's empowerment and for women's participation. And I, I used other examples this morning in, in my talk uh, a short while ago. I was talking about the need to also bring into the equation natural infrastructure, both standalone and in terms of, of complementing physical and built infrastructure, to look at governance issues. A lot of the forest issues or forest governance issues are much broader, and it becomes an entry point through which you can tackle things related to land tenure, related to corruption, related to how to better manage and how to better prevent lost revenues and how to better apply uh, different types of incentives. Uh, so there's a whole range of issues that are outside of the sort of usual suspect targets that provide really critical entry points for having landscapes be what I call sort of an organizing principle of the SDGs. We had a, long, a lot of discussions in the run-up to the SDGs and during the SDGs of, of whether things related to environment should be standalone or mainstreamed. And I think we can actually have it both ways. We have those standalone targets, but we need to make sure that they don't become isolated and that we really integrate this and, and build up a greater understanding, not among ministries of the environment, but as I was saying, sort of that proverbial uh, minister of finance of why these natural resources, the ecosystem services, the ecosystem resources underpin all of that economic growth that everybody keeps talking about. Well, it wouldn't look different than what it is now. It, let me just start off by saying that this is an intergovernmental process. I'm no longer part of that intergovernmental process, so I'm withholding all sorts of any kind of judgment as to what the process should be going forward. But that said, what came out of the intergovernmental process so far is pretty good. You know, it's good enough for hitting the ground running, it's good enough for implementation. So I would think that say that with what we have right now, we have to take a hard look at it and see how you take it a step forward. And if we're really intelligent about the next step, which is actually starting to look at the indicators, if we can come up with really smart indicators that cut across or that establish those linkages between sectors or between enablers and sectors, then we might end up with actually a proportionally smaller number of indicators than we have targets. We shouldn't assume that because we have 190 Eight, 90, 69 targets, we have to multiply that by, I don't know, five or seven indicators per target. And that's going to be, I think, a challenge. And what, what really will be the decisive issue there is statistical capacity and is the cost of monitoring. So there we really need experts to come in. There's so many indicators out there, we don't need more indicators, but to judiciously select which are those indicators that are the most relevant. And as, you know, if I can hark back to my previous incarnation, Columbia had proposed this idea of the dashboard. And the, the concept there is that when you have a truly universal agenda, not all indicators will be equally relevant for all countries, either because it's not relevant because of geographic conditions, for example, or because there are different points in the spectrum of development, or because different parts of the country are at different steps, in uh, uh, phases in the, in the spectrum of development. So that will be an, an, another level of complexity, if you will, is how you have those, those indicators reflect the differentiation both between countries and within countries. Well, I think that the SDGs are a historic opportunity. Uh, you know, it's the first time that an intergovernmental process has produced metrics. So the degree of ownership is extraordinary. So rather than complaining or trying to see how you can make it even better or more perfect, 
we should just recognize that what came out of New York is quite remarkable and that the, everybody's appetite now is for implementation and that it's not no longer just governments. Look at the New York Declaration on Forest. It was private sector signing on to that. So private sector, civil society, everybody's ready to start to implement. I think that's where the conversation has to be now. How do we actually do it?